Our topic this week is called The Closing Crisis. And for those of you that may be joining us for the first time tonight, just want to give you a quick overview of what we've been covering. Uh, The church here has chosen as the theme a contemplation on the closing scenes of the life of Jesus. And that's fitting, that's appropriate, because while we should behold and contemplate Jesus' life, if we were to focus especially on a specific part of his life, it's the closing scenes that demand or require our attention and study. And why is that? Because as we look at the closing scenes of Jesus' life, it is impressed upon us more clearly that sin is something so dreadful, something so foreign to God, that it was necessary that it would require such a tremendous sacrifice. Now, I shared with you that in my preparation for this presentation, I discovered that there are some amazing parallels between the closing scenes of Jesus' life and the events that God's people will go through in the not-too-distant future. And yesterday, we saw that while Jesus was praying and agonizing, there were disciples there in the garden that were doing what? What were they doing? They were sleeping. And I want to read two quotes for you as we embark on our study tonight. I read this yesterday. By these sleeping disciples is represented a what, everybody? A sleeping church. When the day of God's visitation is nigh, it is a time of clouds and thick darkness when to be found asleep is most perilous. Right before Jesus comes, will there be another repetition of that event in the garden when the disciples were sleeping right before that tremendous crisis? Will there be another repetition of that before Jesus comes, yes or no? Yes. And while that's happening, praise God, there's another group that looks like this. I saw some with strong faith and agonizing cries. What were they doing? pleading with God. Their countenances were pale and marked with deep anxiety, expressive of their internal struggle. Firmness and great earnestness was expressed in their countenances. Large drops of perspiration fell from their foreheads. Now, I want you to know that this experience of prayer that these believers have, I believe this is during the time of trouble, but this experience that these believers have, this is indicative of a life spent cultivating the science and practice of prayer. Now, tonight I want to ask you to take your Bibles and open with me to the Gospel of Luke. As we begin tonight, my study is entitled Flight and Fight. Now, I know when we introduced it earlier, we said flight fight or flight, but the subject title is actually fight and flight. Luke chapter 22 tonight, and I want to invite you to look with me starting in verse 42. Now, yesterday we read about Jesus' agony there in the garden, and we learned that this was the point when the decision was made that he would become the sin bearer. And as the crushing weight of those sins came upon him, the Bible says in verse 42, he prayed, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Verse 43 says, and there appeared a what, everybody? An angel unto him from heaven, doing what? Strengthening him. Now, I want to ask you a question When Jesus prayed, (coughs) what was his prayer specifically? What was he asking for? He said, if it be possible, let this what? Let this cup what? Pass from me. In other words, if I don't have to, let this suffering, let this burden be taken away. And as Jesus prayed, Luke records 
that in answer to his prayer, an angel comes. I'm so thankful for that classic, The Desire of Ages. I want to read for you what this angel came to do. Now notice, in this awful crisis, when everything was at stake, when the mysterious cup trembled in the hand of the sufferer, the heavens opened, a light shone forth amid the stormy darkness of the crisis hour, and the what everybody? The mighty angel who stands in God's presence occupying the position from which Satan fell, came to the side of Christ. The angel came not to take the what? The cup from Christ's hand, but to strengthen him to what, everybody? To drink it. Now, I know that some of you could look at this from the outside and say, God didn't answer his prayer. After all, his prayer was, if it be possible, let this what? Cup pass. And when the angel came, the angel didn't actually say, hey, good news, you don't have to do this. The angel actually came to say, you have to do this, but God is going to carry you through. Now, I want to talk to you for a moment about what it means for God to answer prayer. I'm going to tell you a true story. This is a true story. In Trinidad, in a city called Porta, Spain, there was a Christian gentleman by the name of Rainey, Brother Rainey. And one day, to his surprise, Brother Rainey discovered that he contracted leprosy. Now, this is not that long ago. This is like maybe 40 years ago. And recognizing that this disease would ultimately or or, or could possibly cause problems, the government of Trinidad actually quarantined individuals with this disease in a special colony, a leper colony. And so they took him to the leper colony, and their brother Rainey began to witness. He was an Adventist, a Seventh-day Adventist. And as he began to witness, people in the leper colony gave their lives to Christ and joined Rainey's church. Now, they couldn't attend his church, obviously, and he couldn't either, but you understand that they ended up becoming Adventists. But Brother Rainey was praying, and as he prayed, he asked the Lord to deliver him. Now, how many of you have ever been sick before? You had someone that, a loved one that was sick, and you prayed for deliver. Have you ever done that before? I have. And uh, even as we speak, I have a grandmother who's 103 years old this year. Praise God for a health message, (laughs) amen? But she's 103, but as you can understand, her health is not perfect. Uh, And I've prayed for my grandmother at different times when she's had some falls and she's broken things, and I've prayed for her. And I want you to understand that God wants us to bring our burdens to Him, amen? Amen? He does. He wants us to bring our burdens to Him. Brother Rainey prayed, and God healed him of his leprosy. And he left the colony. Does God answer prayer? He answers prayer. But once he left, those believers that he had helped win, after like a year or so, some of them fell back. Some of them backslid. And because he kept in touch with them, he began praying for them. And he prayed for them, and he prayed for them. And one day, one day, to his surprise, he discovered that the leprosy had come back. Now, I want to ask you a simple question. Did God answer Brother Rainey's prayer 
Did God answer the prayer of Brother Rainey when he asked for those believers that had slidden back to be strengthened? Did God answer that prayer, yes or no? He did, because you know what happened? And this is a true story. It's recorded in the, uh, the Review and Herald. He went back, and this time, not only did he bring those backslidden members back, but he even won more people to the truth. Sometimes we don't understand God's bigger plan in the way that he answers prayer. Because there are some of you in here right now, and maybe you've been praying about something. Let's say you have a financial situation that has burdened you for months, maybe years, and you've been struggling, and you've been struggling, and you've been praying, Lord, you've you've asked God, help me with this situation. Maybe God knows that unbeknownst to you, if material prosperity came your way, Maybe God knew that that material prosperity would have the effect of alienating you from God and from truth and from being dependent on Him. Now, I want to be careful because there's nothing wrong with money, amen? But I want you to see the perspective on this. In other words, sometimes when we pray and we ask God to answer our prayer, if we don't get what we asked, We think God didn't answer the prayer. We think, oh, just pray more. But what we don't have to realize is that sometimes God does answer the prayer, but we don't realize that He's answered it according to His will. Does that make sense? When Jesus prayed, God sent an angel, and the angel didn't come saying, hey, guess what? God said, since you've prayed and you've prayed long enough, you don't have to do this anymore. No. The angel came and he said, you've got to go through with this, but God is going to give you the strength to make it through. Some of you here tonight have been praying about a burden in your life. And you've been praying and you've been praying and you've been asking. And even though you've been praying, God didn't give you the answer that you wanted. But what you may not see is that even though God didn't answer it the way that you wanted, God has been giving you the strength to endure that particular trial. So God is answering the prayer. He's just not answering it according to your will, but he's answering it according to God's will. Folks, if we learn this, if we understand this, that God loves us so much and he knows what's best for us. My, my, I have three sons and my oldest two, they wanted to get a bow and arrow. And I don't know, you know, maybe some parents can relate. At the time they were like eight and ten. And I foresaw like gouged eyes and all kinds of horrible things, you know. And I'll be honest, I said no. I don't want this because it's not that the bow and arrow was bad, but I just felt like to do this could create some problems that could be irreversible. And do you understand that God is this way? When we pray, God sees the bigger picture. And so whatever you're going through tonight, whatever thing that you've been petitioning God for over the last, maybe the last week's, months, maybe even years. What if God knew that to grant it according to your will could potentially be salvational threatening? Maybe God understood that the best answer is, I'm going to give you the strength to endure this trial. I want to ask you to take your Bibles now and come with me to Gospel of John chapter 18. John chapter 18. There's some details that are only found in this gospel. Come with me to John chapter 18. And I want to ask you to look with me at verse 2. Before I do that, I, I do want to make this point. Some people would ask, why would God want me to suffer? 
That's a fair question, isn't it? Why would God want me to suffer? How could it be that not answering my prayer of healing or of financial you know, help or uh, re- relationship, how could that be a benefit to me? Do you know Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation. He said that. And for years I thought, why? Why does God say that? Why is it necessary? And Paul says in Romans 5 and verse 3, no, and we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulations worketh patience. You know, folks, sometimes the way that God develops our character is by permitting the trial to be there in our lives. And so if you're here tonight and you're wondering, God, why, like, are you cruel? Do you not see what I have to go through? Tribulation works patience. And the Bible describes God's last day people. It says, here is the what? Patience of what group of people? The saints. If you want to be a saint, we have to learn patience. I want to ask you to look back at John chapter 18, and I'm going to ask you to look with me at verse 2. The Bible says, And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Verse 3, Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh hither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all these things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Now, if you read the Desire of Ages that same angel that ministered to Christ during his garden agony manifested his presence, and by that glory, everyone just fell backward. But then it says in verse uh, 7, Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 8, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. Now, when I read this, one of the things that stands out to me is that Judas comes with the mob. Now, There is a parallel to this that will take place. There will be betrayals that take place when the final crisis comes. And although we do want to focus on the the closing scenes of Jesus' life, for a brief moment, I want to talk to you about Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus. But why did he do it? Why did one of the twelve covenant with the priests to betray Jesus. It actually started years before. And I want to read you something, again, from the Desire of Ages. And here's what we're told. When Mary anointed the the Savior's feet, Judas manifested his covetous disposition. Do you remember when, when the feast at Simon's house took place and Mary washed or anointed his feet with the alabaster box. And then Judas, you know, said, why this waste? You know, this was like a year's salary. An ointment perhaps worth somewhere in the vicinity, like, like our money, maybe like forty or $50,000. And so as this, uh, as the treasure of the disciples, he spoke out against this, what he considered to be a waste. And I want you to notice that Jesus spoke out against that. And we're told at the reproof from Jesus, his very spirit seemed turned to gall. Wounded what? Pride and desire for what? Revenge broke down the barriers 
and the greed so long indulged held him in control. This will be the experience of everyone who persists in tampering with sin. The elements of depravity that are not resisted and overcome respond to Satan's temptation, and the soul is led captive at his will. Do you know that that Judas wanted to teach Jesus a lesson? Now, folks, we don't realize the danger of harboring bitterness in our hearts. We don't recognize how dangerous that is. Now, when we think of the final crisis, we think of the sleeping disciples, and we can look at these, but for a moment we have to talk about Judas, because there will be believers that play the part of Judas at the end of time. And I want you to remember, we learned on our first night together that when Jesus spoke words, the disciples were told what they would do, but they didn't hear it. Why? Because they were blind to their own condition. They could not recognize their true heart condition. And as I say this tonight, as I say that some of us in here may end up playing the part of Judas, I know that most of you, or probably all of you are saying, not me. Not me. I'm not going to betray God's people. It's not going to be me. But my question to you is, as you sit here tonight, is there anyone against whom or to whom you harbor bitterness, resentment, or animosity. You know, over the years, I've conducted evangelistic meetings around the world. And, you know, it's hard to know if a person's ready to be baptized unless you ask them the right questions. And I've had members of my church that We're preparing for their imminent death. And as a pastor, you have to really understand, how do you know that someone is really right with God as they're facing eternity? How do you know? And you know what I discovered? As simplistic as it sounds, I learned that one of the best evidences that a person is truly saved is if they have no bitterness or animosity against anyone living or dead. Can I explain why that is? Let me explain why. Righteousness is obedience to God's law. Does that make sense? And a person can only see heaven if they have righteousness. Not their own, but the righteousness of Christ. But do you understand that love is the same thing as righteousness? Love is also the fulfilling of the law. Does that make sense? So if I could say it another way, you receive righteousness by faith, but you receive love by faith as well. That's why the Bible says faith works by love. So if you want to know if someone is really righteous, if someone is really right with God, all you have to figure out is, do they really have divine love? Now, look, let me, let me point something out. It's easy to love your family. It, it, at least it should be, okay? I, I realize that's, I made a mistake there, but it should be, right? It's easy to love your friends, right? That's not true. That's not the real test. The real test is can you love the person who kisses you to betray you? That's the test. Do you understand that we love Jesus as much as the person whom we love the least? I don't know if you understand that. That's a biblical principle. We love Jesus as much as we love the person who, or as much as we love the person that we love the least. As you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it to Christ. Does that make sense? 
And so what that means is, if you harbor bitterness or animosity against anyone, what that really means is that you don't really have that righteousness which comes by faith. Now, that's what I ask my baptismal candidates. I'll say, look, I just have a quick question for you. Is there anybody that you can think of before you get baptized that you have to forgive in your heart? Is there someone that's wronged you over the years? Is there someone that, that's hurt you that you need to forgive before you make this, this public declaration of a new life in Jesus? you would be amazed at how many people struggle with bitterness and anger. Some of you might know uh, my ethnic background. Well, I was born in the States, but my ethnic background is Korean. And Koreans are like fiery people. That's why the North and the South, they're still fighting, you know. (laughs) And uh, the truth is that it may, you know, this is not an excuse, but I think that some cultures tend to be a little bit more passionate than others. And you know what? That being said, that just means that I need Jesus. Does that make sense? You know, we don't think that Judas, we, we, don't, we, we often think that, you know, Judas was this, this horrible person that kissed and betrayed Jesus. But really, when you distill it down to its essence, the characteristics which Judas possessed are some of the very same characteristics that some of you are struggling with, maybe even tonight. And if you don't let it go, you might think in your heart, no matter what, I'm not. But those those cycles will ultimately repeat themselves. History repeats itself. And some of you will play the part of Judas at the final crisis before Jesus comes. I want to read you one more statement that's fascinating. Judas reasoned that if Jesus was to be crucified, the event must come to pass. His own act in betraying the Savior would not change the result. Now, I don't know if you understand what he was doing here. This is a very interesting thing that he, he, he uh, justified in his mind. Judas' reasoning was like this. If it's going to happen, I'm, I might as well get something from it and be involved. Now, you know, I've heard that very same argument from people that I've talked with that are not living right. Like, I've heard someone say, even if I didn't go to work, they're still going to be open and they'll still be doing business anyway. I might as well just go. I, I heard someone say, and this is not the same line of reasoning, but uh, I had a, someone that was getting ready to get married and the, the, the guy was not a believer And you know, the Bible's clear, don't be unequally yoked. But the reasoning was, his father is an Adventist pastor. You know, the devil can play tricks with us, isn't that true? And we can get caught up in these ethical justifications, you know, these situational ethics. I'm only reading this to you because I know that people play this game today with not paying their tithe, you know, they'll, they justify it by saying, you know what, if I do this and I make this and I pay this off, then I can make more money and I can serve God more fully. People can reason away anything that they're supposed to do. Judas did that. But you know, what's amazing is that Judas wasn't the only one that failed in the final crisis. He wasn't the only one. There's someone else that failed in that final crisis. Do you know who it was? It was Peter. Now, I want to ask you a question, and and this may not be easy to answer. But who caused Jesus more pain? Was it Judas or was it Peter? Who caused Jesus more pain? Who? It was Peter. And I can prove it to you tonight. I want to read this for you from Desire of Ages. This is after he betrayed Christ. I'm sorry, after he denied Christ. At last... 
he found himself in Gethsemane. So he left the hall of Caiaphas and Annas and he went to Gethsemane. The scene of the few hours before came vividly to his mind. The suffering face of, the, of his Lord, stained with bloody sweat and convulsed with anguish, rose before him. He remembered with bitter remorse that Jesus had wept and agonized in prayer alone, while those who should have united with him in that trying hour were sleeping. He remembered his solemn charge. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. He witnessed again the scene in the judgment hall. It was torture, look closely please, to his bleeding heart to know that he had added the what everybody? The heaviest burden to the Savior's humiliation and grief. Who added that heaviest burden? Who was it? It was Peter. You know, we, we look with abhorrence at the name Judas today. The name Judas is associated with treachery, with betrayal. It is a name that is loathsome. I don't think any mother wants to name their child Judas. And yet, what we may not realize is that between Judas and Peter, Peter was the one that caused greater grief to Christ in his closing moments. Now, the reason why my sermon tonight <clears throat> is called Fight and Flight uh, is because of what happens. Now, I'm going to ask you to come with me to John chapter 18. And I want you to look with me at verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having a what? A sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant uh, and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Now, Peter, when he saw the mob come, in his zeal to defend Jesus, he pulls out a sword and he cuts off in the darkness a man's ear. But not long after this, Peter in an apparent reversal of courage, runs away. And we are told that he was the one that convinced the other disciples, and they all fled. Now, you have to ask yourself, why did this happen? Um, I'm going to read to you. I want you to, I want you to notice something that is an unmistakable parallel to Peter's experience, but in the last days. Look closely. As trials thicken around us, both separation and unity will be seen in our ranks. Some who are now ready to take up what? Weapons of warfare. So, you know, in other words, there are people that want to fight their way through this thing at the end, okay? And I want you to notice that that's the same spirit that Peter had. Do you realize that? He was going to save Jesus by his sword. But notice these same people, notice these same people, some who are now ready to take up weapons of warfare will in times of real peril make it manifest that they have not built upon the solid rock. They will yield to temptation. Those who have had great light and precious privileges, but have not improved them, will under one pretext or another, what will they do? Go out from us. Now, folks, I want you to notice this. There are people at the end that are ready like Peter. They're ready to fight. But when the when it really comes down to the wire, these people are going to ultimately leave. They are going to fight, and then they're going to take flight. And I want you to notice why it says they do this. They've had great light, 
and precious privileges. Folks, when I preach in the U.S., I have no problem saying and feeling the freedom to preach things because I know that the level of knowledge in the Adventist church in the United States is significant. You know why? Because we have three ABN. And we have amazing facts. And we have all these wonderful books in the English language. In fact, at a num- I've noticed a pattern now. More and more in our churches today, I see books piled up in boxes from members who have donated them. Now, I don't know why they donated them. Maybe they don't have any more room because they bought so many other new books. I don't know. But like I, like I was just in a church a few weeks ago, the entire baptistry was full of books. And folks, all that light, all that knowledge. And look, talk about uh, precious privileges. Man, we live in a country where we can visit some of the very places where this movement was born. We have institutions, giant institutions. You know, if you ever wonder what kind of an impact has Seventh-day Adventism had on our world today, you don't need to go any further than our Adventist healthcare system. I mean, I don't want to toot our own horn, but it's one of the best healthcare systems in the world. Quick story. When I was visiting Thailand, the president of the hospital gave me a tour. And he told me that when the president of the United States had visited Thailand, they reserved one room at the Bangkok Adventist Hospital. Now, I don't know if you know this, but when a president travels overseas, before he even gets there, they reserve one room in the best hospital in that capital city. Because in the event of an emergency, there can't be any delay in treating the president. Does that make sense? They did that at Bangkok Adventist Hospital. Uh, Look, I'm saying this to you because we are privileged. You know, people around around the world eat peanut butter every day without realizing, hey, this guy, uh, John Harvey Kellogg, thought of this to help people eat eat more nuts, you know? And, uh, I mean, I won't get into all the details, but we have tremendous privileges. And yet, many of us, aren't improving on them. Now, I want to read the rest of this. Not having received the what? The love of the truth. Now, let me explain. There's a difference between having the truth and having a love for the truth. There's a difference. Are you with me? You know, whenever I preach evangelistic sermons, I'll come to some, like, very juicy nights. Like, tonight we're covering the mark of the beast, and sometimes I'll do it in, like, two parts. Tonight we're talking about the Antichrist, you know? And always, at the end of the first night, I'll have people say, hey, hey, just tell me. I just want to know. Just tell me who it is. Tell me what it is. You know, tell me. And, you know, they're, they're curious. They want to know, right? And it's not wrong to know. That's not wrong. But some of these people will learn about the Antichrist or they'll learn about the mark of the beast and then they'll go right back to living exactly the way that they've been living up until that point. You know why? Because they have received the truth, but they don't have a love for the truth. Does that make sense? A lot of people, a lot of people, they like the idea of having the knowledge, but they don't have a love for the truth. And that's the class of people at the end of time. They're the ones that at first, they're like, they look so zealous, like we're going to fight our way out of this. And then they're gone. They want to fight, and then they take flight. How is it with your soul tonight? Have you had great light? Have you had amazing privileges? And have you approved upon them? Have you received a love for the truth? You know, I'm sharing this with you because I want you to realize that these same characteristics that existed in Peter, who caused such agony to Christ, those same characteristics 
they may exist in us as well. I, I'm running out of time, but I want to read you something here. Um, please notice how Peter could have avoided this. Therefore it was that he gave them warning. Had those hours in the garden been spent in watching and what else? And prayer. In watching and prayer, Peter would not have been left to depend upon his own feeble strength. He would not have what? Denied his Lord. It's very simple, folks. It's very simple. If Peter had done two things, what was that? Watch and pray. To watch means to stay awake. And yesterday I shared with you what it means to sleep. If Peter had stayed awake and if he had prayed, he could have avoided denying Christ. Is there a need for God's people before the final crisis to have this same experience, yes or no? Now, I know that some of you are going to wonder why I'm reviewing this, but I've noticed each night there's always some new people. So yesterday I gave you four practical points on prayer. Tonight I'm going to add one more, okay? Then we're going to close. Yesterday I shared with you that we are counseled to have a special place to pray. I have a very tiny, tiny RV. It's not that tiny actually, but compared to a house it's tiny. But I have a place right by my bed where I pray. If you have a home, you have a place to pray. So you need a place to pray, and not only that, you need a time to pray. You could have more than one, but you should have at least one, okay? And then you need to pray. And now, this is not an always thing, but when you're doing your secret private prayer, it's good to pray aloud. Because we've all experienced that when you pray, sometimes your mind goes off on tangents. Have you experienced that? And you know what? I've learned this. When I articulate my words in my prayer, like when I articulate my thoughts, somehow the act of just saying out, out loud uh, like uses more of my brain and I'm less likely to wander off in my thinking. And then, if your mind wanders, you have to bring it back. These were four points I covered yesterday. Tonight I want to add one more. This one's very important. Now look closely. Prayer and faith are closely allied. Prayer and what? Faith. faith. Prayer and faith. And they, need, and they need to be studied together. In the prayer of faith, there is a what? A divine science. It is a science that everyone who would make his life work a success must understand. Now, before I go on, please notice that it's not just a matter of praying. It's praying and having or exercising what? Faith. And this is a science. You know what a science is? It's something that's governed by laws. Does that make sense? Okay. So, it's a science. Christ says, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, what's the next word? Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. He makes it plain that our asking must be according to what? God's will. Now, I'm going to give you a quick illustration. Let's say that I'm standing outside of the bank. And I see these people, they go in and they give the, the teller a, a piece of paper. And the teller gives them some money. And people come out with you know, wads of cash, and I think, man, I'd like some money. So I go into the teller, and I say, hey, could I, could I get some money, like $2 or $5? What's the teller going to say? He's going to say, where's your check? Where's the check? And really, if you think about it, the check is the promise that you will receive the amount on the check. Isn't that right? Do you realize that faith is 
the means by which we get what God has promised. Does that make sense? You know, uh, let me finish the statement and then I'll... (laughs) And whatever we receive must be used in doing His will. The conditions met, the promise is what? Unequivocal. Now, let me make a point. Every promise in the Bible has a condition. Let me say that one more time. Every promise in the Bible has a condition. Let me give you an example. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be what? Added unto you. I want to ask you, if we want all these things, which is food, drink, and all our daily needs, if we, add, if we want that, we have to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. The Bible says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy what? Days may be long. Can God extend your life? There's a promise. Is there a condition, though? You've got to honor your father and your mother. Can God forgive any sin? Yes, but the Bible says, if we, what? Confess. He is faithful and just to forgive. There's a condition, and it doesn't matter. There are hundreds of promises in the Bible, but every promise has a condition. I want to tell you something. If you, want to, if you want to revolutionize your prayer life, yes, it's important that we have a place to pray and a time to pray. And we want to try to make sure that we you know, pray aloud and we keep our mind focused. But if you want to revolutionize your prayer life, combine the Bible with your prayer life. Open the Bible. Find a promise. As you're praying, say, Lord, you've said in your word that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. You've promised that. And Lord, here is my need tonight. Friends, you, if you exercise faith with prayer, you will begin to see God's hand working mightily in your life. Now, if for years you've been praying and you've just been asking God, part of the reason why you may not have been seeing things is because maybe for one, you weren't asking according to God's will, but number two, maybe you didn't realize the science of the connection between faith with prayer. And faith is always based on God's word. Does that make sense? And so take the Bible, open it, Find those precious promises. And as you pray, say, Lord, you've said it in your word. It's here. You've promised this. And I come to you now asking that you would fulfill your word. Friends, God has some amazing things that he's going to do in these last days. But it will be in answer to the prayer of faith according to that divine science. Tonight I want to ask you to take your hymnal. I'm going to ask Audrey to come up, and she's going to play number 476. Number 476, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. And as we sing this tonight, maybe you have a burden on your heart. Maybe it's the burden of bitterness, because let me tell you something, folks. Bitterness is something that you are carrying that hurts you more than someone else. Bitterness is like swallowing poison and hoping someone else gets hurt. And the truth is that that's a terrible burden to bear. And you know what? You can't get rid of it unless God comes into your heart and gives you the gift of forgiveness. Some of you have burdens for loved ones. Whatever it is, if you have this special burden on your heart and you want to pray the prayer of faith, you want God to intervene for you tonight as we pray, I'm going to invite you to come to the front. I'm going to ask our pastor to have a closing dedicatory prayer. But as we sing number 476, speak to God in your heart, and let's sing all three stanzas. Hymn number 476.